The Democratic Republic of Congo has endured one of the most bloodthirsty, most devastating wars in Africa's history. Around four million people have died. Now, though, there is peace, officially. But the killing hasn't stopped. And it's all about one thing. Control of Congo's vast mineral wealth. Deep in the forest, a long way from anywhere, a short tarmacked road with one straight bit. Wali Kali, one of the busiest airstrips in Congo. They call this the Wali Kali Express. 15 or more planes in and out every day, pillaging $2 million worth of loot every week from a jungle outpost that's been at the heart of this deadly conflict. Within 50 miles of here, 10 mines. In these sacks, the mineral everyone's after, a red rock, cassiterite, better known as tin ore the most traded metal on the London Exchange. It's now used for electronic circuit boards, and prices have hit a 10-year high. Here, the battle is on for control of the mines and the trade. But we've been warned not to film soldiers. The UN's here, but they don't venture far from base. Peacekeepers have never set foot in the mines. Yet, it's the plundered ore that fuels the conflict by buying more guns. Civilians continue to die, a thousand a day. The crisis festers like a tropical ulcer. There has been a lot of fighting in Walikali, and it's affected everyone. During the war, they were all forced to flee into the jungle, and you can only imagine what it was like. No water, no food, no help. There were bad times. Thousands of desperate people had abandoned their farms and fled to the mines, but few had come back. So what was keeping them out there in the jungle? The biggest mine, BCA, was said to be lawless and remote, 40 miles through the forest. Even Buto Muiso, the head of the government's mining division, had never been there. These are difficulties you are in the process of getting to know. Imagine with this vast territory, we have to walk through the bush, sleep wherever, be displaced, not eat, have nothing. It's really painful. But that's why we are working for our country. We must do everything possible to inspect every corner where mineral exploitation is happening. Like him, we wanted to find out who was in charge there and who was making the money. We were told we might reach BCA in one day, maybe two. No Westerner has made this journey before. Throughout the trek, we were to catch fleeting glimpses of government soldiers making their way towards the mine. At BCA, we were told, they are the predators. This primary forest was for more than a decade infested by genocidal killers and half-starved militias until they were routed by the Congolese army last year. The trail was rugged and arduous, but it's busy as a motorway. 4,000 porters ply this route carrying sacks of rock heavier than they are. Each of their 50 kilogram packs of cassiterite is worth $400 on the world market. Government soldiers often force porters at gunpoint to carry the rocks free of charge. If they're lucky, though, they can make up to $5 a day. Prince was a merchant until the last marauding army burned and pillaged BCA and stole all he'd earned. Like everyone else, he had to start from scratch. I'm exhausted. I am carrying 50 kilos. I have a wife and two children. But we don't earn much and we endure many hardships. Sometimes you end up with no pay at all. You could die along the way too. When you reach BCA, you will see the graves of porters like me.
Prince had already slept one night in the jungle. He had another 15 miles to go. If he was to make it to Walikali airstrip by sundown, he had to get moving. Other porters are eager to share their tales of hell. Hundreds, they told me, had been killed in the last bout of fighting at BCA between crazed militias I'd not even heard of. Not one of them knew their cassiterite was destined for the electronics industry in the rich world. One man claimed he knew. It goes to America, he said, to rebuild the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. <laughs> the trail, unforgiving, wound on and on, up and down, for mile after endless mile through the humid forest. After nine hours, we arrived at a jungle clearing in which was a squalid encampment. We were still a long way short of BCA. So we're here in the jungle for the night, alongside all these cassiterite porters, and we're just putting up camp here. We passed hundreds of the porters on the trail today, all carrying the great big 50 kilogram sacks of rock. Now, I've got to say that the electronics industry for which their rocks are destined seems a million miles away from here. By chance, we meet a tribal chief from BCA and his administrator. They tell us how the traditional inhabitants of BCA Mountain have been thrown off their land at gunpoint to make way for mining. I find it's very hard being here in BCA. The militia set fire to the town and all houses were destroyed. I managed to escape, but lost all my possessions. I am not happy at all, because all the wealth, the family inheritance, has been taken away from me. And it is others who gain all the profit from what was left to me by my ancestors. I don't benefit, and that makes me sad. I'm not at peace. I am the chief of the Bangandula tribe. In the name of all the Bangandula, we say, we don't like those people who bring problems to our forest. So we want our mountains to come back to us. The dank air reeked of stale sweat and exhaustion. The porters ate their only meal of the day. It rained all night, but no one seemed to notice, for at Koba camp, we sleep like the dead. At dawn, the Cassiterite porters moved on, and so did we. Late morning, an ambulance passes by. Too sick to walk, this woman faces two or three days on this porter's back before she reaches a small hospital, only recently reopened by Médecins Sans Frontières. Five hours into day two, we stumble across a graveyard in the jungle, as Prince the porter had said we would. We knew we must be close to BCA. Here lay victims of war, starvation, overwork, malaria, typhus and cholera. By a river, the first signs of mining. We've been told there are around 6,000 miners here. At this point, the trail goes straight up. No one had seen the likes of us in these parts before. As we near the top, work stops as they gather to stare. In the absence of any mine management, government soldiers rule here by gun law. By the time we got to the top, all the soldiers had removed their uniforms and hidden their guns. But on the way up, one member of our team grabbed this shot. Troops here can go unpaid for months. They make up for lost earnings, though. Congo's tin soldiers make a killing. The miners were cheering because word had gone round we'd come to help end their plight. Among 
them looking on the malevolent presence of soldiers. It's just that we don't know who's who. The mining had left a huge scar down the mountain, once sacred ancestral land for the local tribe. Most of the work goes on deep underground. Well, this is it, cassiterite. It's tin oxide. It looks like a rock, but it's much heavier. It feels like a chunk of metal. Even deeper inside the mountain, down the shafts and rickety ladders, conditions are subhuman. In the hole, you have to crawl and squeeze and suck in your belly to make it through. The next danger is the huge rocks above. Often they bury us and once they move, it's instant death. Then there is the darkness and there is no air. Once you get down more than 200 feet, the airflow stops altogether. It's up to you to figure out how to breathe. As you crawl through the tiny hole, using your arms and fingers to scratch, there is not enough space to dig properly and you get badly grazed all over. And then, when you do finally come back out with the kazitrite, the soldiers are waiting to grab it at gunpoint, which means you have nothing to buy food with. So we are always hungry. The miners don't work for money. The rocks the soldiers don't steal are traded for food. Most become deeply indebted to traders, who themselves get stuck here for months, able only to witness the horror of daily life here. The miners work for nothing. The soldiers always steal everything. They even come to shoot people down the mine shafts. Yes, not long ago, they shot someone. They forced the miners to give them everything, and they threaten to shoot anyone who argues. They are always ready to shoot. We are really penalized. We earn nothing, but we pay a lot. The soldiers, they are all around us here, but they are in civilian clothes. Even the government's own Ministry of Mines has been rendered powerless by the greed of the Congolese army. Security is not respected. We live in a state where only the fittest survive. Different armed groups do what they want with the population for their own ends. The state doesn't benefit at all. We need to bring back order and get respect for the Ministry of Mines because, at the moment, everything is done for those who are the strongest. We demand that order is established. In that way, everyone can be in their right place, the military in their barracks. 100 years ago, the novelist Joseph Conrad described the colonial plunder of Congo as the vilest scramble for loot that ever disfigured the human conscience. Nothing has changed. Cassiterite is mined and quartered by people who are cannon fodder for the industries of the rich world. Five armies have battled for control of PCA mine in just five years. The morality of trading in Congolese cassiterite is now under the spotlight. Having seen what goes on here, we wanted to track down the middlemen who were making handsome profits literally living off the backs of these people. Soldiers everywhere guarding their loot, which is flown out of here by middlemen who sell the mineral on to Congolese export agents and the foreign importers. Demand for cassiterite has surged because new laws in Japan and Western Europe have resulted in tin replacing lead in the manufacture of electronic circuit boards. Global demand for tin is directly linked to human rights abuse and the battle for control over mines such as BCA.
Destination, the provincial capital, Goma. Old Russian plane, Ukrainian pilot, no seats. We've hitched a ride on a cassiterite plane going back to Goma, the Wadi Kali Express, and sitting on about 1.7 tons of the mineral. It's a hefty payload. Some planes don't make the corner. The eastern border town of Goma, Congo's Cassiterite capital, where there's a heavy UN presence, but no intervention in the mineral trade. Much of Wali Kali's ore is transported illegally across the border to Rwanda for international export. First, it is washed, ground, and sorted here. These trading houses are called contours. Shwede Chisugi is a Congolese businessman who knows the trade inside out. He insists there's nothing immoral or illegal about it. And where does it go from here? It goes to export to Europe. To Europe. Yeah. And who buys it? The, the contour? Yeah, by road. We take uh, by road, Kigali, Kigali, uh, Nairobi, uh, Uganda, Uganda, Nairobi, Nairobi, Europe. Huh. Yeah. From Mombasa port? <coughs> From Mombasa port. What is your answer to the people who say this country is being looted? We buy it in Walikale, in the bush, and then transport it to Goma. In Goma, you work on it, and then we pay tax to get it exported, and we export it. It's not stolen. Shwede takes us to a private compound where the ore is being ground and prepared for export. An argument breaks out over whether we should be allowed to film in the comptoir. Shwede himself may not feel there's any reason to be worried by our presence here, but others are. The global trade in tin is a secretive world. We're in search of a British businessman who was proving particularly elusive and media shy. We knew that he was one of the two biggest cassiterite buyers in eastern Congo. We eventually caught up with Ketan Kumar Katecha in Bukavu, another border town where his family, the Katechas, have been in business for more than 40 years. We spent an hour and a half talking to Mr. Katecha in this office, discussing the corporate ethics of buying minerals in a conflict zone. Our conversation became increasingly uncomfortable. His firm, Afrimex, has been exporting cassiterite from eastern Congo for more than 20 years. But Mr. Katecha refused to go on camera, agreeing instead that I could represent his views in our report. I was about to do exactly that when the provincial security chief arrived. At police headquarters, we were questioned and our camera and passports were confiscated. We were released without charge the following day and put on a boat back to Goma. We could only speculate that Mr. Ketan Kumar Katecha, a powerful man, had had enough of our questions. Now, what he did say to us yesterday in his offices and in defense of his interest in the Cassiterite trade was that what he was doing was absolutely legal. He said, and I quote, yes, salary structures are very low, but it's better that miners and porters earn something than nothing. If I didn't do it, he said, someone else would. I'm not here to be some kind of moral savior. But it's a moral savior that Congo needs. It's powerless and 
impoverished people at the mercy of other people's greed. Things are so dire here that there is no expectation that life will ever get any better. Congo's government can't control its own army or protect its own people. The people cursed by the riches under their feet. 